<laughs> so, Bunny. Yes. If you are a long time, thank you. If you are a long time listener of this podcast, then you know two things about me, Reverend Steve. One, that my wife and I are absolute besties, yeah. despite Hi, despite never having sex. <laughs> and two, <laughs> in the last year. True. Oh, I was saying in the last thirteen years. In the last thirteen years, yeah. We've, we've had sex at least three times. And number two, I am a lover of history. I am a regular historianitanist, which, which, which is a technical term that only we historianitanists use. But I'm also a storyteller with my own unique style. So what I like to do is I like to get a little-known story from the history books and reword it via my own unique razzmatazz. Yeah. Which which people should use more. And I don't know why people don't use the word razzmatazz more. But I'll tell you who I blame. I blame Donald Trump. Do you know why I blame Donald Trump? Mm, you know, any more one reason is as good as the other? No, because Obama had more razzmatazz. Yeah. Yeah, he did. Yeah. And so that is what this is, another exciting and educational installment of our long-running series, Steve's yeah. Historical Approximations, or SHAP as I like to call it, whether anyone else likes that or not, I'm hoping that Shap takes off, you know? Teens start wearing yeah. Shap hats to the mall or whatever has taken the place of the mall in the life of a teenager. In fact, I think that Shap could really be the next BIM, yes. you know? Yes, it could. I really think that Shap could take off. Citizens, be sure to wear your Shap marks in public. <laughs> so this week's Shap is an interesting one. It's the story of the missing link that was frozen in ice and how it went from a major national obsession to hiding in the back of a gift shop in Austin, Texas. It's the bizarre story, the bizarre true story of the Minnesota Iceman. Okay. So back in the 1950s and the 1960s and the 1970s, that was when you could still catch a good, creepy, and possibly illegal traveling sideshow. Yeah. You know, it would pop up in an abandoned field, a bunch of sketchy guys. There was maybe a tent with uh, women getting naked, very dangerous rides, Yeah, possibly something with a monkey. So... Uh, back then, there was a trade magazine called Amusement Business. It was an insider sideshow magazine. This is the place where you find the first article written about what they then called the mysterious Siberian creature. The article uh -huh. appeared in Amusement Business Magazine in July of 1967. The article said that uh, to see the creature cost 35 cents, 25 cents for children. The so-called Siberian creature was frozen in ice in a coffin. So it's this big, huge coffin that, all, that, is, that is frozen in ice, and it's constantly frozen via a generator that was connected to it. Yeah. This thing toured all over America going, Mommy. Eleanor, what, baby? Oh, puppy. Puppy? Oh, puppy? Yeah, I like puppies too. Thanks for pointing that out. That's awesome. Keep doing what you're doing. Uh, so the mysterious Siberian creature toured all over America, Illinois, Kentucky, Arizona, Minnesota, Kansas, and even the Oklahoma State Fair. 
which we haven't gone to because the California State Fair was so great that there's no way that my family can go to the Oklahoma State Fair and not be depressed off our fucking asses. <laughs> okay. All right. So inside of this frozen coffin, it, it, it really looks like a really big, really tall, like... Like one of those giant freezers, but it's on its side. Yeah. Except it, it, the top of the freezer is just ice, so you can look inside of the freezer. Inside of this freezer is a six foot tall, hairy, man like creature that its owner, Frank Hansen, claimed to have purchased in secret in Hong Kong this missing link. Um, he claimed to have purchased okay, this. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. He he claimed to have purchased this uh, this mysterious Siberian <laughs> creature, which is what it was originally called, in secret in Hong Kong, where it was fished out of the Russian Ocean by some bewildered sailors. Now, in my mind's eye or whatever, I imagine that he bought it in a small, mysterious curio shop, just like the <laughs> one where they bought Gizmo from. Yes. Uh, Either that, or it's a mysterious curio shop run by Christopher Walken. I, uh, you, or, 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 the, or the curio shop where you can buy a Lambit configuration. No, no, I'm thinking it's a curio shop where you can apparently buy a mysterious Siberian creature and also a cat that you can transfer your consciousness into. <laughs> yes, yes. There's not a lot of people doing Nine Lives references. No, there's not. Not a lot of people doing references to Kevin Spacey cat movies. <laughs> but I like to think of myself as a trendsetter. So later, Frank Hansen would change the creature's origin story. Oh, no. Uh, originally, uh, no, I didn't get it from Hong Kong. I got it from this place. And then he would uh, rewrite the story. He would change the story again. Oh, no. Okay. No, the, the truth is really that I got it here. Then he finally admitted that what really happened was he simply shot the creature while hunting in the woods in Minnesota. That's why it's now called the Minnesota Iceman. Originally, yeah. he got it from Russia, and then he got it from, he bought it in Hong Kong, but it was fished out of the ocean by bewildered sailors, and it was floating off the, the ocean of Russia. No, I actually got it here. Okay, fine. I shot it in the woods in minnesota but honestly the origin story of this creature does not matter it's how the creature was treated in american society that is the real crux of the story it's amazing but this is what we're going to do bunny uh -huh. we're going to put this story on hold on pause for a bit okay and and, and talk about the beatles okay okay uh just trust me on this just just follow me. The Beatles were a culturally redefining rock band. Yes. They changed music. They changed celebrity. They changed the cult of celebrity. They Their music really did change the globe. So then they broke up. And can you imagine being in that band? Being in this band that was bigger than Jesus, and then you're just yourself? Yeah, I, I, I literally can't imagine, because I have tried. I have tried, and that's why I would really like, like to talk to one of the last two. Like, what the fuck is yeah. it like to just be you? You know, I mean... When you've done this just like enormous thing, like I've heard a lot of astronauts suffer depression really bad, you know, because they went to the moon. Now what? You know? Yeah. And, yeah, and so. I think I think I think the Beatles would have to have that same feeling. Yeah. We are you in were the Beatles. 
you know, you were a member of the biggest band in the history of music, and now you're on your own. That's got to be just the stress and pressure of having to live your life as a human after being in a band that was essentially a god. Yeah. You know, how do you even begin to process that? Well, if you are John Lennon, what you do is you deconstruct the mythology surrounding the band's popularity, which is what he did on a talk show. I believe it was the Dick Cabot show. I might be mistaken, but he, he was being interviewed on a talk show and they asked him about the Beatles and how big that was and how important that was. And he says, real honestly, look, we were four guys. I went to Paul. I said, do you want to join me band? Yeah. Then George joined. Then Ringo joined. We were just a band that made it very, very big. That's all. Yeah. It's John Lennon trying to process the full weight of his overwhelming fame. Yeah. You know? Like, yeah, we were huge and we were amazing and everyone knows us, but we were just a band. So, so that being said, Telling the story of the Minnesota Iceman is really difficult because there's two sides to it. A shocking number of people still think that this is all true. I yeah yeah, it because it, I was like because I, I I haven't heard it by that name and I don't really recall what name I've heard it. Okay, but I, I've I've yeah. heard the story roughly in quite a few creationist evolutionist debates yeah Uh, a lot of a a lot of and and not only that like creationist evolutionist debates but also fucking bigfoot people bigfoot people yeah fucking bigfoot people because eventually frank hansen said okay fine i shot it in the woods and it it, deep in the woods in minnesota so now bigfoot people point to the minnesota Iceman. it's like well see here's the proof here's our smoking gun so a shocking number of people still think that this is all true that this was a missing link this amazing incredible epic discovery there's a lengthy article about this shit on scientificamerican.com. <laughs> a massive multi page front cover article in Scientific American magazine, for Christ's sake. People took this shit seriously. Yeah. So there's two sides. On one side, Frank Hansen discovered the missing link between primates and humans. But there's another side, and the other side is. Much like John Lennon and the Beatles, the Minnesota Iceman was just a stupid fucking carnival act that made it very, very big, that's all. Yeah. Because the 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 creation was was the the creature was really just an original take on what carnies used to call a pit act where yeah. there's a pit of some kind or in this case an ice coffin where people well, I, paid and then house. gathered around the pit and then gawked at whatever the amazing wonder is in the 80s the Arizona State Fair would have these like animal acts yeah or yeah yeah or it would be like a a, a real mermaid or something like that and just some stupid girl yeah. in a fish tail yeah. Yeah, like whenever we would go to the Arizona State Fair, we would have quarters because like for 50 cents you could see the world's biggest bull. <laughs> yeah. And then or you could, or you could go over here and you could see like a giant Florida gator. I have a really good story about that on uh, on my blog somewhere gathering dust yeah. about the giant Florida the giant Florida gator story. But then there was a there was a pit a pit act and it was there was this big banner, and it it said, "World's smallest horse?" Question <laughs> mark. And you would pay at fifty cents, and then go around this pit, and there's just this tiny little baby Shetland horse living in the smallest cage, living the saddest life. Oh. So, uh, Frank, so F- Frank Hansen was just looking for. He was a carny guy, and he was looking for an interesting act. And he's like, "Huh, I need an interesting act." You know, people really like pit acts. 
And maybe I could come up with a pit act. You know what? I think I have an original idea. What if? And then he came up with the Minnesota Iceman. Okay. Or I. Okay. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. I. I. I ha- I'm just having an interesting thought. Okay. Yeah. I. Because. Because I. I know exactly what you're talking about, and I know this the exact exactly the environment and everything that you're talking about. I can smell the hay with your description. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. But now. All of that doesn't it doesn't it feel very conspiracy theory ish? You know, maybe don't. They have a second podcast. They have a secret alien. They have a. You know, they have an alien behind the sheet or or something like that. So I'm wondering if everybody is going for conspiracy theories. Because there aren't enough good carnivals anymore. Yeah. You know, if you buy into the Fiji mermaid, you buy into the the Malaysian air flight. You you just kind of do, right? It's that same mentality, isn't it? Yeah. Sorry, I just thought that was interesting. No, no, no. no, That understands. I, we I we need that. we need so, more carnivals so, and so, carnivals can save this country. That's my last word. Yeah. Why did you get me out of my headphones? So it's it's difficult to tell this story because either Frank Hansen came up with the most popular pit act in the history of mankind, or he literally was just hunting in the woods in Minnesota and accidentally shot a Bigfoot. Oh, okay. and 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 so so yeah so I didn't expect Deanna to be listening to this part, and I hope she doesn't get upset because I came up with one joke that I thought may or may not upset her, but now she's back eating ice cream on the couch, and so I'm just gonna power through this. Okay, so this thing, the Minnesota Iceman. It toured all over America for like two or three years, literally all over America, every major city, every every small city. This thing is touring all over America. And so a few tiny local papers write articles about it. Then a few bigger papers write about it. Then major papers write about it. Then there's articles in the New York Times about the fucking Minnesota Iceman. Then magazines are writing articles about it. Then, in 1968, two noted cryptozoologists decide to examine the Minnesota Iceman. Okay. And in 1969, they announced, yes, this is a genuine creature. Now, I'm sorry to anyone who might be offended, but in my mind, noted cryptozoologist is right up there with rich banjo player. <laughs> or sexiest yes. or sexiest Radio Shack employee. Um, <laughs> He's the only one, though. He's the only one. But it exists. Noted cryptozoologist. Really? Steve How do you put Martin that on a resume? Steve Martin? Yeah. It, it, I, I wrote I wrote Rich Banjo Player specifically because oh. when Steve Martin first started out, he would always whip out his banjo and start yeah. playing, and he loved banjo, and he was really good at it. And then one day he does The Tonight Show, and after The Tonight Show, he did it with Milton Berle, noted asshole. Yeah. And Milton Berle just comes up to him and says, Hey, you know something that no one ever says? And Steve Martin's all excited, and he's like, oh, you're going to tell me a joke. One of your famous zingers. What do, what do you never hear someone say? And he says, that limousine belongs to the fucking banjo player. <laughs> and that caused Steve Martin to not play the banjo for like two decades. Yeah. But eventually he got back to playing the banjo and now he releases albums and he like tours doing music. And yeah, he's the only rich banjo player. But the thing is, 
He didn't get famous for the banjo. No. Okay, you didn't say famous for the banjo or rich for the banjo. You said famous, a uh, rich banjo player. He's yeah. Rich and he's a banjo yeah. Player. Technically, he's a rich banjo player. Right. In the same in the oh, same way you can. No. In the same way you can refer to Woody Allen as a rich clarinet player. Yeah. 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 I'm on board. So, so two noted cryptozoologists study. The Minnesota Iceman in 1968. In 1969, they they announced when we examined the creature, there was putrefaction on the body where some of the flesh of the creature had been exposed from the melted ice. This is proof that this creature is real. Also, when they were examining the creature, the uh, the 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 glass screen cracked <laughs> and a disgusting smell came from inside a smell that could only come from a decaying corpse mm -hmm. so these two cryptozoologists write a lengthy paper of uh, ex explaining their findings in a noted belgian science journal okay they announce their findings thanks again a, belgium yeah they announce their findings. They say that the Minnesota Iceman is a legit hominid, and they called it a new species called Homo porguadis. And this creature was the legitimate missing link between apes and humans. Oh my God, Bunny! Suddenly, the Minnesota Iceman is on the front page of magazines and newspapers and shit. People took this all seriously. Okay. So from much a cryptozoologist. So people took this so seriously that like in the late 60s, early 70s, finally, a scientist from the fucking Smithsonian cracked his knuckles and said, hold my beer. <laughs> so he goes to Frank Hansen and he says, OK, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Belgian cryptozoologists. <laughs> Let's have an American Smithsonian scientist examine this creature. So he goes to inspect it, and almost immediately he just turns around. Uh, yeah, total fake. Jesus fucking Christ, guys. Really? <laughs> you, this, this is all bullshit. This is all bullshit. This is like a styrofoam thing with like hair glued on it, and <laughs> it's in ice so that the ice covers up the fact that it's fake. Like, how did you all believe in this? <laughs> so then, and why did it have to the, be kept frozen? <laughs> yeah. So then Frank Hansen says, well, I was afraid the original would be damaged. So of course it's a fake. I switched them. Oh, that is the fucking same as the alien autopsy thing. Yeah. 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 I switched the original with this fake one because I did not want the original to be damaged. Hello. Mm-hmm. So after the Smithsonian debacle, the Minnesota Iceman toured for a few more years, but it was obvious it's like the 70s now. People are wearing bell bottoms and getting groovy. It's obvious that that the New York Times article writing days were over for the Minnesota Iceman. So eventually, it's the 70s. The Minnesota Iceman retires from the touring carnival biz, and it disappears for decades it just completely disappeared and the only people who the only people who remained talking about the minnesota Iceman were fucking bigfoot people really okay yeah bigfoot people still talked about the minnesota Iceman. they're like oh the minnesota Iceman. what happened to it it disappeared you know why it disappeared it disappeared because it was a bigfoot and people conspiracy uh. yeah to this day, Bigfoot people think that the Minnesota Iceman is it. So the Minnesota Iceman is gone, right? Yeah. Then a wild story emerged. So um also also uh I haven't I haven't tried checking it. I haven't tried tracking it down, but 
the Minnesota Iceman was apparently in a really good 80s episode of Unsolved Mysteries. Robert Stack style. Really? Okay. Yeah, I love Unsolved Mysteries. So uh, a, a separate story emerges. Like like you're uh, like you're playing Pokemon and you're going through the bushes. Suddenly a, a wild story emerges. It's Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas is oh, it has always been sort of like the the home of the odd and the strange. So a gift shop opens up in the Congress Avenue district of downtown Austin. They sold postcards and knickknacks and various typical gift shop sort of stuff. The owner is a guy named Steve Boosty whom I have spoken to personally and honestly geeked out a little bit over. He actually is there almost every day, and he wears a big giant fez. Did yeah. You yeah, I fangirled over Steve Boosty because I'm like, oh, my God, that's him. I saw him on the Travel Channel. Yeah. I, I read <laughs> articles about this guy. He literally came up to me, and he whispered in my ear. He's like, honey, honey that's him, the one in the fez. That's the owner. <laughs> Talk to him. And yeah. I was like, oh my god. Yeah, I was okay. super excited. <laughs> so Steve Boosty's kind of a weird guy, and he decides, um, you know what? I've got some kind of weird, odd items. I'm going to show them off in the back of the store. And so he puts some of his weird, curio, bizarre oddities in the back of the store. And then, like, a couple of months later, he notices, oh, shit. People are coming in just to see the odd shit in the back of the store and not buying anything. They're just coming in, looking at the stuff, and then leaving, and that's it. (laughs) So he goes, okay, well, um, I've got more weird stuff. Maybe I should put some more weird stuff in. And then so more people came in, looked at the stuff, and then left not buying anything. So he's like, hmm... Well, that's all the odd shit I have, but what if I can collect some more? So he spends millions of dollars, like, looking for the weirdest, bizarre, crazy things. And then, boom, in 2007, in the back of his gift shop, he opens the Museum of the Weird. Okay. Cool. In the in the front of it, it's a small, odd gift shop, and I'd like to take this time to say that my wife bought a dead baby octopus in a jar. Nice. No, no, I would go for that. I would totally go for that. Yeah. Like I said previously, I, I I've always wanted a pickled punk. Yeah. You know, you know. Yeah, the, they had they the had dead, all these jars. The dead babies like, in the jar. Yeah, yeah, they had a bunch of that stuff, but it was like dead animals and creatures and stuff. And Natasha had to get the 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 dead baby octopus. Yeah. It's in a jar. It's in our room. It's by our bed. Uh, it's on my dresser. Which is by our bed. Next to my tentacle fingers. Oh, yeah, next to your tentacle figures, you fingers, which you also got at the Museum of the Weird. Are you done? The place is amazing. I love tentacles. And then and then you go to you go to the register and you buy tickets and then you're taken on this tour throughout the the winding corridors of the back of the gift shop. Uh, it's filled with a lot of Ripley shit. So it's got the Fiji mermaids, the shrunken heads, the the mummies, uh, two headed calves, and an impressive selection of wax sculptures, which uh, uh, Steve. Boosty actually saved from another since closed down Austin tourist attraction. And then, so he's always looking for weird things to put in the Museum of the Weird. And then in 2013, you never guess what resurfaced. The Minnesota Iceman, the original, was put on sale on fucking eBay. Oh. The family of Frank Hansen is just, okay, uh, so we suddenly have inherited a ridiculous amount of carnival crap. Yeah. When are we going to do all this shit? I don't know. I guess we'll start putting it on eBay. Okay. Uh, Minnesota Iceman for sale. Toured America uh, for sale. So, so uh, Steve Boosty bought it. It turns out a, a young Steve Boosty actually saw the Minnesota Iceman as a, ti- as a child when it toured America. So he bought it 
And uh, that shit, the resurfacing of the legendary Minnesota Iceman, it made the front page of Huffington Post. It was big news. Really? It was it was such big news that the transportation of the Minnesota Iceman in his uh, ice coffin from Minnesota to Austin, Texas, um, uh, the transportation of it uh, was featured it in season four, episode six of the show Storage Wars. Are you, are you kidding? No, the entire episode is focused entirely on the challenges with transporting the Minnesota Iceman. Oh, okay. But that's not the weirdest part. The weirdest part is the Minnesota Iceman was also featured, oddly enough, in an episode of Cake Wars. Okay. (laughs) They made a Minnesota Iceman cake. And... I have insider information that the cake just tasted okay. <laughs> That's because they, they left it out in the rain. They left it out in the rain. Yeah, no, elbows. Cake Wars. Not Cake Boss, Cake Wars. Cake, wars is, cake, cake Boss would have been so different. Yeah. Okay, so we's going to make an Iceman cake. And they'll be like, what? Yeah. We's going to make... <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. No, it's okay. okay. It's okay. My okay. son likes race cars. Can you make like a race car? What's he gonna do? We're but, gonna, but, we's gonna make a giant race car that he can actually drive and then eat, and then it's <laughs> gonna catch on fire with your son in it. <laughs> <laughs> so here's here's the here's the amazing <laughs> finale of the story. So okay. then, the newly resurfaced oh Minnesota Iceman just gathered dust. In the Museum of the Weird until March of 2008 when it was visited by noted cryptozoologists Amber Spain and Isabella Galindo, who not only announced it to be one million percent authentic, but also announced that their father, Steve, was the best father in the world for taking them to see the Minnesota Iceman. (laughs) Oh, I didn't even know that the Minnesota Iceman was back there. I just thought that it that we would be tour, we would be going on our own. I just thought that we'd be going on our own through the Museum of the Weird, and then suddenly yeah. some guy appears, and it's just, hey, you want to join us? We're going through a tour, and suddenly he's giving us a tour through everything, and we get into this giant room that's like padlocked, and we were told like, hey, you know, you you can take whatever pictures you want, whatever videos you want, but we're very serious here, and we have a strict policy about this. You must turn off your phones. Put them in your pocket. There are no photography allowed from this point on. And we were not allowed to take a picture of the Minnesota Iceman. Very few pictures exist of him. Really? Yeah. Very few pictures exist of him. To keep the mystery of it alive and all that sort of thing. So I I have no pictures of the Minnesota Iceman. Just call the tourist guy Jared. Yeah. Yeah. But can you draw it? Huh? Can you draw it? If we got a police sketch artist, can you describe uh, actually, it? Actually, there there are there are sketches of it. There's a number of them. In fact, there's a really good sketch of it on the Wikipedia page for the Minnesota Iceman. Okay. Yeah. No, there's pictures all over the place. There's there's drawings all over the place, and then a few photographs, but but none of them take it. None of them, you know, do it justice. It's something you kind of have to see for yourself. Anyway, it's there at the Museum of the Weird, Austin, Texas. The place is fucking amazing, and I'm in love with it. It 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 was just really fortuitous because it was near my birthday, and Natasha wanted to go uh, out to the outskirts of Austin, Texas, to Dripping Springs, which is apparently a place, because that's where there is a... You're holding a knife at me, and that's scary. I'm not. I'm cutting wrong. Okay, okay. Well, we're both right. You are you were holding a knife at me, and you are cutting broccoli. Uh, there, chopping broccoli. Chopping broccoli. She's chopping she broccoli. Chopping broccoli. Uh. Chopping broccoli. Uh. <laughs> Girl, hold it. So, so Natasha wanted to go visit a brewery, which I have a hard time saying. Brew brewery, 
And then she said, hey, we can go and do a road trip to go to the brewery if you want to. Uh, uh, Steve, is there anything you always wanted to see in Austin, Texas? And I don't think she even got done with the word Texas before I belted out, the Museum of the Weird! <laughs> like, that was the first stop. That was okay, the first look, stop. I'm not saying that Steve's birthday trip was a selfish thing, but it was kind of a selfish thing. Yeah. I got to go. I got to go to the place that I wanted to go, but he also had a good time, and he got to go to places too. Yeah, I did. I am. I am looking at a picture of of the Minnesota Ice Man on the wiki page, as you suggested. Is he doing the Macarena? The Minnesota Ice. Wait, what did you say? Is he doing the Macarena? No, it is kind of weird because he's got one hand up and then like another hand around his junk. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh. One of the it, apparently when he when he was shot, he would the creature was shot two times, once in the eye, which de- dislocated one of the eyes, and then the second time was shot around the gut, which is why the creature is posed the way it is, with one arm up and one arm like around his gut and crotch. You should look up the giant spider monkey. Ooh, okay. Oh my God. Okay. The giant spider monkey. Giant. The the creature is either A fake, B Bigfoot, or C um uh Robin Williams' grandfather. Okay. Because that's I'm how going, Robin Williams was. I am going with C. Doggy? Is the doggy outside? Yeah, no, it, it the the mood that the Museum of the Weird uh, sets before you go in and talking about, uh, you know, giving you a quick look at the history of the Minnesota, telling you about the Minnesota Iceman, showing you pictures of art articles about the Minnesota Iceman, and then uh, having you all put your phones away. Yeah. And, and then you walk into this cold room and there's not a lot of light and it's kind of dark and the main light in the room is just the light coming from inside this giant freezer where the, this frozen creature is there. And you and all of these strangers and friends are gathered around it just looking down. It's a really creepy experience. Yeah. We were all creeped out. Bella was creeped out. Amber was creeped what, out. What's creep, who, what's just the mood that they set when you go in to see the Minnesota Iceman. You know, okay. they, they make you put your phones away. They tell you yeah. the history. There's not a lot of light. You're crowded around this freezer. There's it's, a black light. Too. Yeah, yeah. And there was like a black light in the room. And, and yeah, the ice is so thick that you can't fully see it, but you can make out definitely here's a face and it's looking at you. And, <laughs> and you can see the fur and the fingers. And it's just, it's a really creepy experience. <laughs> Okay, and, I, I, I and, need uh, an emergency break real quick. Sorry about this. Oh, no, that's fine. I, I am actually done with this bit. So you go to the bathroom, and I'll just wrap up. Whoa. And it looks like that is it for Steve's historical approximations this week, or shaft, as I like to shove down people's throats. And I hope that you all enjoyed getting your goddamn learn on. Next week, we will be talking about two things that I swear do go together. Next week, we will be talking about Bambi and hardcore twisted pornography. That is next week on Steve's Historical Approximations, or Shap, as I like to repeatedly shove down people's throats. And cut on that. Well... We still have our movie to uh, talk about. Oh, hey, Bunny's not here. Let me say some things. I kind of didn't like this week's film. But I'm going to I'm gonna try and have a positive like, attitude about it. I like he's going to hear that when he ends I know he's going to hear it eventually, yeah. But but I, I knew he liked the film, and I you Google the film, and there's all these articles talking about how this is like the second coming of fucking Jesus Christ, this fucking movie. Speed Racer, undeserved gem, one of the greatest films of the 21st century. Like, Jesus fucking Christ, calm your asses down, people. So, so like, I'm, I'm going to try and have a positive attitude going into this week's film. So that'll be fun to watch. 
to listen to or watch, I guess, if you're listening to it on YouTube. But uh, before we get to that, maybe we should take a break. Should we take a break, Barney? I think we should take a break. And also, Steve, you're so handsome, and I love you, and I want to have your babies. Oh, thank you, Bunny. Also, your voice is a bit weird, but, you know, whatever. We'll We'll just power through it. We will be right back with more of the Pope on Film after these commercial massages. Hey. Uh, and cut on that. Jeannie, are you there? Uh, yeah. Do you want to do your the show? No. Okay. Then, uh, Bella, you want to you want to tag tag me tag me tag me tag me out. Tag me out. Come on, come on, come on. I want to take. Does she does she not want to tag you or does she not want to do the show? <laughs> no, don't touch you. Tag. I touched you on the shoulder. That is considered a tag in the world of professional wrestling. So 56. Okay. Just writing the time. Bella, you go do your thing. Hello. Hi, Bella. Hi, so I heard I think I heard the bad news. I'm so sorry. Hold on. I guess oh God. Okay, what were you saying? I had to get something. I said I heard the bad news and I'm so sorry. The bad news? Yeah. I heard that you had to go back to school. Hey. <laughs> uh, is, uh, is this true? I love not having school. <laughs> great, uh. great. I mean, like, it's it's cool, but after a while, it's just kind of lonely. <laughs> And boring. Stuck in a house with the family. Yeah. Cuss at me, mom. <laughs> oh gosh. You know what, Bella? I think you the should. Black people. Bella, I think you should go back and listen to like one of the first ones of these shows that we did, because oh my gosh, you've grown up so much. Huh. Huh. Yeah, before you were a little girl, and now you're, like, halfway there. <laughs> yep. Uh-huh. So, what about have you thought about what you want to do with your life? Uh, <laughs> Remember back in the... Not live in Oklahoma. Oh, there you go. Uh-huh. Remember when we used to do the questions, one? like, what's your favorite shade of lipstick? What's your favorite kind of sandwich? What is your favorite what's sandwich? Your... Sandwich? Yeah. Uh, hmm. 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 What is your favorite sandwich? Types of sandwiches. Ham and cheese, turkey, roast bacon, beef, peanut BLT, butter and jelly. Yeah. Roast beef. Like, there's uh, anything. Peanut butter and jelly. What are you going to put in a sandwich? Because they're sandwiches. That's true. Do you not eat I sandwiches? Not, uh, you can put anything between two pieces of bread and call it a sandwich. Uh-huh. I, usually I know people who eat spaghetti. In, in the fridge. They eat spaghetti sandwiches. Which I don't get. Oh, my God. But spaghetti any, sandwich. Taco yeah. sandwich. Pizza <laughs> sandwich. Lugania is a spaghetti sandwich. Oh, well, spaghetti cake. Oh. Mm-hmm. I mean, I put uh, the spaghetti on top of uh, garlic bread, so. <gasps> That's kind of like a spaghetti sandwich, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's an open face spaghetti sandwich. There you go. And, yes. Oh, no. Don't sell yourself short. You know what a sandwich is. You've been making them. You just didn't realize it. No, I know what a sandwich is. I just don't know what it is. 
I I usually just get meat in, in the fridge is in the fridge and then I put it on bread. Oh okay. Whatever your mom buys. Like, your mom or dad buys, that's what you eat. That's good. I that's mean good. mostly dad. Uh, dad dad's the one who buys meat for the sandwiches. Uh-huh. So does he buy like what he likes? Uh yeah. Yeah. Mostly. And good thing for me, I got his taste buds. That is a good thing if he's the one doing the shopping. You're right. Yep. Exactly. I'm always right. Did you have huh. dinner? Did you guys have dinner yet? No. I don't think so. I'm, I'm pretty sure we haven't. No. No, we haven't. <laughs> Okay. Guess what it's doing what, here? What are, Guess what it's doing here outside? It is freaking snowing. Oh my god. It's snowing. Crazy. And the other uh, oh, and yesterday on my way home from work it was 73 degrees. Uh the day before that it was almost 80. Today it's snowing. Like and the wind is blowing like the cat's on the table. I know you can't lift it. <laughs> the cat is take the cat is taking over our house. We're I'll push to throw the cat off the table. <laughs> it's the coffee table. It's the, like a lift up coffee table. <laughs> Here, let me see if I can poke him. Move, move, move. Get up. There he went. Okay. Beat him with Mom. a stick. Mom, what are we having dinner? Okay. Mom. 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 And I, I just want to say in your show, I, I, I am really happy watching you, Bella, grow up. Oh, my God. I just it told is, her that. You did? Seriously. See, it's not just me, Bella. Yeah. When we first started this, oh my you, gosh. Were, you were still just a little girl, and you were about as no annoying as Maxwell. <laughs> What? And and you wow. you you've just grown up so much. My God, I seriously, I just yeah. I just told her that. I told her she needs to go back and listen to like the first couple ones that we did. Yeah. Thank you very much. You, you are very, but I I still offended. That, you feel offended? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I I was young. You sound so. mature hey, 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 now. No, yes. right on. Yeah, wait until you're in high school and everybody finds those podcasts. Oh God! Uh huh. They're gonna say, "Oh, so Bella, you're so cute." And I'm still bringing up President Buckethead. No, all, all you, all you were is what you were supposed to be at that age. Yeah, that's true. And now you're supposed to be. Now you're something this. else. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Oh my God. Yes. Okay. Let me tell you a little story that's kind of comparable to this because when I was uh, just out of high school dating my used to be husband, and um, we would we'd go on like these little road trips and go camp out. Me and him and a girlfriend, a friend of mine, and two other guys, and we'd just hang out, have a bonfire, whatever. And um, so I had this little tape recorder, cassette recorder that I would just like put in the van and turn on to record conversations that were going on. Yeah. And so years later, years pass, I have this cassette tape still and my Ooh. boys find it and they're teenagers. Oh, and you know what they did with that? Oh, they took it to parties and they played this tape at their parties. <laughs> and I never got the Dad. tape back. So it was a party tape oh, for my God. kids. <laughs> I guess that would be an early podcast, wouldn't it? 
I was ahead of my time. Uh, so anywho, Spella, what else you got? What else news do you have besides having to go back to school? What? Um... Hmm. Stuff. That's my only answer. Okay. <laughs> All righties. Was your dad back? Uh, what? He's... I'm always back. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, because I need to go take a break. Eeks. He's just, he's just in the kitchen. Okay. Whatever dad does. Whatever dad does. Okay, well, I'll talk to you next week, Bill Boo. Talk to you next week, Jeannie. All right, bye. Bye. Hi. I talked for you while you were gone. Oh, cool! Thank you. I appreciate yeah, it's, it. it's all right. You had you had a. I gave you a weird voice. I'm not sure why. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> and we're back with more of the Popon film. Act three, bitches. Yes, it's Act three. The shocking finale of the Pope on film. Finally, all your questions will be answered. Who will live? Who will die? What is this rash on my inner knee? Should I go to the doctor? It itches. It feels like some sort of poison ivy, but also it's not like I'm just hanging out in the woods, you know? Yeah. There's no... There's no way that I would get the poison ivy, like it burns too, like I don't even know what to do you, you know what, I'm just gonna bing it I'm just gonna google it, webmd and yeah. uh keyboard click in parentheses and well, okay webmd says black plague I have the black plague you have the black plague boy, that escalated <laughs> quickly I mean, that really got out of hand fast. It did. It went up a notch. It did, didn't it? Yeah, I stabbed a man in the heart. Just to watch him and die. That. And so with that firmly out of the way, it's time to discuss this week's movie. The 2008 Wachowski CGI masturbatory fantasy film known as Speed Racer. Yes. And oh my god, people love this fucking movie. I loved it. I loved it. I fucking loved it. I'm going to have to fight you on this one. People love this movie. I had no idea the cult really? behind this movie. Yeah, no, I have no the, idea about that. There, There's a fandom of people who just adore this film and said that it, they say that it failed in the box office because it was ahead of its time. You know, it, it was too advanced for, for people in 2008. And, like, sure, there might be something there. Personally, I attribute the, the failure of this film to two things. Yeah. Number one, um, we aren't 100% ready yet for all CGI films or CGI heavy films that aren't yeah. action that are like a non transformer in like when I think of speed racer, I also think of like sky captain in the world of tomorrow. Uh, another movie I absolutely love. I love and, uh, too. and Scott Pilgrim versus the world. That's another heavy one, but yes. that one's a bit more subtle and jokey video gaming and its use and, and just, Whenever one of these movies come out that's just heavy sci-fi, you know, unless it's a freaking Star Wars movie, people are just not ready for it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. In fact, I felt, I felt so bad for anyone who had to drive a car in this movie. Mm hmm Because I remember seeing the blooper reel in the, the second Star Wars prequel. 
Yeah. Which one was that? Uh, uh, not Attack of the Clones. Attack of the Clones. I remember seeing that the blooper reel and, and fucking George Lucas is making what's her name Natalie Portman. You know she's acting out that scene where they're at the whatever droid factory. Yeah. The lava filled droid factory, and she has to okay now roll under that. And then, then you need to jump over this. Now this is going to be coming out your head, and you're going to have to duck this, and then go under there. And she just loses it, and she's like, "This is just a prank, right? You're just pranking me. This is all fake. You're just, you're just it's just an elaborate joke, right? Like, like this is ridiculous." And George Lucas is just, "Oh no, it'll look great in post." But it's like, but still, she's just in this giant CGI warehouse pretending yeah. that things are dangerous. <laughs> So I just felt bad for all of the people who had to drive in this movie because they're just in like a half-built CGI fake car pretending yeah. that everything is scary and thrilling. That's got to be so difficult, you uh, know? A lot of the Avengers movies are like that too, yeah. Yeah, it's got to be so difficult. I just, you see a close-up of somebody, I saw a close-up of somebody driving in this film and every time I just went, oh, bless your heart. <laughs> pretending like this is thrilling and scary. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's got to be tough. I don't think I could do that. I'd be laughing. I'd be laughing my ass off because I thought it was so funny. Yeah. So, so number one, I just don't think that people are re ready yet for such a heavy CGI film. Um, number one. And number two... A lot of the failure is just, yeah. I got to say, is the fault of the Wachowskis. Uh, How so? Let me, let, let me try and explain. Uh, yeah, let me try and explain why. They got too big too fast. True. Very true. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, a, a large, in my mind, a major reason why people didn't make this film a blockbuster was it was a Wachowski film after The Matrix. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Matrix was just so big and so culturally defining and culturally redefining, and it changed how people use special effects, changed special effects, it changed so much. It's 2018, and people are still trying to copy The Matrix. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at you, Underworld series. <laughs> you may have fooled everybody else, Kate Beckinsale, but you're not fooling me. Uh-huh. Let's do The Matrix, but with vampires. Okay. Oh. The Matrix. I don't know. The Matrix. The Matrix is yeah. just so sad. So sad. I mean, it had such potential. I love the first Matrix film. It's yes. so good. It's such a good film. Uh -huh. It's so... It's such a wonderful, rich world. Yeah. And, and it, it, it it's amazing, and it's well-written, and it's just the best. The second and third film I only saw once, and that was in the theater... The day that they came out, and I never saw them again because it was such a fucking letdown. I watch them when I need a good cry, you know? Yeah. I'll, I'll put yeah. on the other two Matrix movies. And especially the yeah. second Matrix movie, because I like the second Matrix movie a lot because it was building off of this, off of the first and, and the mythology. I, I liked Colonel Sanders, you know? But then the third just yeah. really fucked everything up. Mm -hmm. And it was like, uh, no, 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 no. Okay, I can accept that Matrix can, that, that Neo can do anything he wants in the Matrix. That's fine. He yeah. cannot do, out in the real world, he's just Keanu Reeves. Yeah. You know? What the fuck is this? He's got psychic powers in the real world now? Because he's yeah. Neo? Yeah. Anyway, that was it. it but Speed Racer, no, I'm yeah. going to have to wrestle you to the death. 
this movie was you really have to be a speed racer fan now the first time i saw it was pretty much when it came out because i was like speed racer i I loved speed racer as a kid but i did go into the movie wanting to hate it okay and it wasn't for like a few days after you know like sometimes you just dwell on a movie you know yeah i I was like no that that was perfect that was that was perfect that was exactly what it should be and when i watched it this time i was totally we had just gotten back from getting the joints uh and (laughs) and i i totally geeked out this this movie is like so perfect the speed racer you know they really hit the tone and the feel and even the that's, races, you know, even the races. That's, that's the key. That's the key, mm-hmm. what you're saying right there. Because at first I'm like, okay, this film is cheesy and it's kind of badly written. Yeah. And the characters are dimensional. And, and and this is like kind of bad. But then I realized, oh, wait a second. I watched a shit ton of Speed Racer. And that cartoon was kind of shitty. Yeah. But it was fun to watch this shitty cartoon. So then I thought, well... If you have really seen the original Speed Racer cartoons, okay, this is kind of perfect. Yeah. This is a perfect adaptation. Uh-huh. Yes. It's, yes, it's exactly. It's easy and unrealistic, and none of these things could happen in real life, and that was Speed Racer. E- even when I was like, holy shit, they've done, they, they have two Racer Xs. That's, that's, that's perfect. Yeah. They have his brother, Rex Racer, who in one shot, in one shot, he looked almost exactly like Tom Cruise. In the library. But, yeah. But in no other shot. <laughs> well, I liked this film because I have a sexual fetish where I get off on rich businessmen eating pancakes. Yes. <laughs> And so I really got off on the pancake scene. Oh, yeah, let's. This is an action film about racing, but let's spend a good five minutes discussing pancakes. Yeah. Yeah, let's spend. Let's let's have a five minute pancake scene and really get down into the details of pancakes in this car racing film. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. I, I oh. no, I, I I absolutely loved it. I absolutely loved it. I, I, and he was I, he was Louis Prothero from V from Vendetta, and Racer X was Jack from Lost. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Like, what the fuck? Because I had to look him up because like I was just looking at his chin, and I'm like, first, okay, that doesn't look like the other guy, and that chin looks yep. familiar. <laughs> The so, thing that I will, I did geek out in one scene. Yeah. Because when I was little, I was I was a pain in the ass, and my parents wanted to s- spend less time with me. Did you have a monkey? No, I had a combination TV VHS player. Yeah. That they got me when I was like seven or eight that I could have in my room. So, and they, what they said was, now you can watch TV and watch cartoons and watch videotapes in your room. Isn't that great? But then the subtext was, we will get to see less of you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's great for us. So I would just watch whatever I could. And, and I was in my room, so my parents didn't care what I was doing. So, so it would be like, Okay, I have school in the morning. I have to be up at 6 a.m. But they are showing an hour of Johnny Carson's comedy classics at midnight. Yeah. I'm going to have to stay up and watch that. I'm a big Karnak fan. Yes. It's painful to me. In a mayonnaise to jar t- on Funkin' Wagner, Wagner's porch since noon today. Yeah, it's painful to me to say these stories out loud and realize that Bella is me. Yeah. It's painful to me to 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 have 
it, it's shocking to me that I haven't made this connection up until now. Yeah. That it's like, okay, okay, so I have school in the morning, but they are showing Psycho at 11 p.m. Yeah. on Channel 45. I am going to have to stay up and watch that. <laughs> so I'm going to bed at like midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., and my parents and my parents are just my parents just don't care. Yeah, they're not angry at me. My parents aren't angry at me like good parents would be. Yeah, good parents would care, but my parents just didn't give a crap, so I just kept doing it. Uh, but I would like I would wake up early on Sat on Sundays because on Sundays is when like the the UHF stations would go. Okay, we got nothing, guys, because yeah. it's a Sunday. No one's watching TV, so let's just throw out whatever shit we can. So, like at five a.m., they would show an hour of the Cisco Kid. Oh God, I I I, I could not get into the Cisco Kid. Yeah, and then and then the and prints then are that, awful. That was the yeah. biggest thing. It was like they were so horribly preserved. If you could, or yeah. is that an oxymoron? That they they're painful to watch. Yeah, and then they show, and then they'd show the classic Lone Ranger, and then the Many Lives of Dobie Gillis, which yeah. I would watch constantly because I just couldn't believe that Gilligan did something else. Yeah, yeah. And I would just watch this show and go, he's so good as Maynard G. Krebs. Why do we just know him as Gilligan? This is equally as good. He's He was the first Shaggy. Yes, he was. How are we not all obsessed with this as a nation? We should at least be obsessed with Maynard G. Krebs as we are obsessed with Gilligan. This is amazing. Yes. I, I, I am in total agreement. And then after that, they would start showing cartoons but it would be the bizarre cartoons that a cheap ass uhf station could afford so they would show like gigantor and speed racer or bat fink or yeah. possibly courageous cat and minute mouse and uh and uh as a child i watched a lot of davy and goliath yes a lot of Davy and Goliath, but I would watch, I would watch, I would only occasionally watch Speed Racer. I wouldn't watch it a lot, but then sometimes I would go, okay, I, I'm kind of bored. Isn't Speed Racer on right now? I'm going to put Speed Racer on, and then suddenly Speed Racer looks at this massive vehicle. Yeah. Wow, that is a giant car. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. And it would be that episode where there's the giant car. Uh-huh. And it's a car, but it's also the size of like a train. But it goes as fast as the other vehicles. But the giant car is actually like secretly the home of like this mob group. Yeah. And I'd go, oh, the giant car. That's pretty awesome. Uh, OK, I'm not going to watch it. So I would watch that episode. And then like a month later, I would go, you know what? I haven't watched Speed Racer for a while. I'm going to watch Speed Racer again. Suddenly, uh -huh. Speed Racer was face to face with a mammoth vehicle. Oh, that looks like a giant car. <laughs> oh, and I'm like, do they only have one fucking episode of Speed Racer? Because I swear <laughs> to God, I've seen the mammoth car episode like forty fucking times. Yeah, what is with the goddamn mammoth car? <laughs> So so when I went to watch the Speed Racer movie, I'm like, okay, I know Speed Racer and Trixie and Chim Chim and yeah. Pops and all that, um, and, and Racer X, and Racer X, which is always, has always been the coolest character. I have a, a, yeah. a general understanding of Speed Racer, but I will say this, there better be a mammoth fucking car. <laughs> if there's not a mammoth car, I'm going to riot. And there yeah. was the mammoth car, and I geeked out when I saw it. <laughs> and there's all cheesy mafia guys and they're beating up the japanese guy and it looks like they're in like a nice spacious living room yeah. but then you realize that they're in this giant massive truck and i'm like holy shit that's the mammoth car yes they're they're in the only episode of speed racer that exists <laughs> <laughs> 
And I, I, I straight up geeked out over that scene. But it was like it was like perfectly cast, you know. Although it was a, a really little, it was a little Chris- creepy. Being yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Because uh, I'm on the Christina I, Ricci we- thing too. I had a really hard time with Christina Ricci's character because it's like you're not doing anything, you're not saying anything, you're you're nothing. You're just this like cardboard wooden fucking thing that just stands up there and you're not emoting and you have nothing to do. You are doing nothing in this film. Why are you even here? You're barely acting. Yeah. But then every time I had a problem with the movie Speed Racer, I had to put it in perspective and i'm like oh god christina ricci i used to love you so much and now i just hate you and i want to strangle you what is wrong with you but then it's like wait in the anime trixie has nothing to do she is just the pretty eye candy woman yeah love interest and that's it she has nothing to do in that sense when you when you really put the source material into perspective okay christina ricci is perfect yes Yes, but the problem I I had... She's perfect. The problem I had is I I, I thought Speed Racer was great, okay? Uh, He was was just a very good-looking kid, you know? Like, he's he's not fully grown up yet, and that shows, you know? So I thought he was great. Yeah. And Christina Ricci looked great, because... With the eyes that she's always had, she was born for fucking anime, you know? Yeah. But then when they would start getting romantic, I would be like, okay, wait a second. Exactly how old is Christina Ricci now? Yeah, yeah, I was kind of doing some math there as well. Because she was supposed to be 18 in this movie. Yeah. She had to have been at least 30. Yeah. 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 So so yeah, no, I had a I had a hard time I had a hard time with that. Um, but anyway, the Matrix was so big that anything that comes after the Matrix is destined to not be as successful. Yeah. Because people are seeing the any other Wachowski movie through they're seeing it through a Matrix filter. You yeah. know? I, I sat down Emerald and I said, Emerald, you have to see The Matrix. It's an amazing film. You got to watch this. So I sat her down and she watched The Matrix and she's like, wow, that's great. Are there any more? And I just went, no. Nah. We don't talk about those. <laughs> yeah. Just, just You don't want any more. You think you do, but you don't. Just, just let it be, you know? <laughs> Let it be. So Sometimes you just stacks. gotta push back from the table, you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, I I was before stats. I was geeking out through through this whole fucking movie, through the whole movie. Yeah. I was like, "That's Razor X's car. That's Razor X's car." That was even before we saw Racer X, and it was like, "Oh, yeah." Racer X, and then Spritel and Chim Chim showed up. I was like, like yeah, Spritel is Spritle. like is and like the pre Danny Bonaducci. I'm sorry, what was that? Spritel was like the pre Danny Bonaducci. <laughs> He okay. and that's yeah. how he was. He was like just like a little con man. He was never he he never did what he was told. And and he had the monkey, which was almost like his brother. Yeah. So that was perfect. Hey. And 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 hey. what? No, no, nothing, nothing, nothing. You keep going. And when they and when they finally completely tricked out the Mach Five, it was like, okay, okay, here we go. We got the blades on yeah, the when front, I, and we got the jumpy things. Yeah, yeah. When I first started watching the movie, I I thought, okay, uh, when he's driving, he's not going to have the buttons that do all the stupid things, right? Yeah. Like this is. This is a semi-realistic, like racing thing. He's not going to be like 
jumping in the air, but then that became the entire film. Yeah. By the time, yeah, by the time they tricked out the car, I'm like, oh, it's all the stupid things. They're adding the stupid things. Yeah. Uh huh. I was so happy. I at first I didn't like the guy who was Speed Racer because it's like, oh, he's really pretty and he looks like Speed Racer, but also like he can barely act and he's just not. He's. I just don't find him that charismatic. But then again, source material. Yeah. I always hated Speed Racer. <laughs> the one and, thing... and that's it's so so like you put it into perspective, and I'm like, oh my god, I would watch Speed Racer for Racer X. Yeah. Oh yeah. I never watched Speed Racer for Speed Racer. So in that sense, oh, they picked the perfect person. He was pretty, and he can act a bit, and that's all you need for Speed Racer. Yeah, Racer, Racer X was important, and it, I fucking love that guy. Racer X was the shit. He was just the shit. And he was the the Dewey Six Machina of the whole fucking cartoon. You know? Yeah. Speed would get into yeah. shit. And if need be, Racer X would pull his ass out. Yeah. You know? And, and it yeah. always ended with a goofy race. Yeah. yeah. You know? And, and yeah, he was always going to the different countries to race in and all that. And like... I really think they nailed this movie. I, I, I would love a sequel. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, that's not going to happen. No. Because of the stats. Before we get to the stats, um, I I am not qualified to have this conversation, but did you ever get into Sense8? Uh, a little. A little? Yeah. Jeannie was watching it a little while, and I was watching it a little. Um, that's that Wachowski TV show where they are all like bound together somehow by a mystical lost kind of force. Yeah, called fucking. Yeah. Was yeah. that it? Um, you know what? They had all fucked, and then that that gave them all the shining. Really? Like, I, I'm not sure. I've only watched very small bits and pieces of it. I, that's why I said I'm not qualified to have this conversation. <laughs> but apparently... But that's going to be that's gonna be a chapter in my autobiography. They fucked and got powers. Okay, chapter but wait a 24. second. But wait a second. Doesn't that make the whole series... Actually, an advertisement with the tagline of "We're the Wachowskis, come fuck us." Yeah, fuck yeah, us, and much. you will get magical powers. Yeah. So anyway, Natasha, Natasha was obsessed with Sense Eight. Yeah. Yeah, still dealing with that loss. <laughs> um. So let's do some stats. I'm really proud of these stats. Um, let's stat this shit up. Speed Racer 2008 film by the Wachowskis. At the time, I was actually I, I thought for sure that when they when they got around to doing Speed Racer, that one of them was a woman. I was surprised to still see uh, directed by the Wachowski brothers. I was surprised to see that. Yeah, I, I thought Lana was already Lana. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought too. But never, never name yourself. Okay, no, no, I got to stop there for a second. Never name yourself Lana. Don't do it. If you have the choice, if your parents do it, you're stuck with it and they're evil fucks. Okay. But if you have a choice of the name, never, never Lana. Don't go through your life with your first name spelled backwards as anal. Don't do it. I just have, I just want to say, and I hope I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure this isn't. I'm pretty sure this isn't going to be offensive to the transgendered community. Okay. But what upsets me is that your name is Larry, but then you decide to live your life as a woman. So what should your new name be? 
You you have your choice of names. Yeah. Why choose one based on your original name? Just hey, whatever. You could be called you could be called Alessandra. Yeah. Your your name was Larry. Now your name is Lana. That upsets me. I, I like think... like if I, like if I became like if I became if I decided to live my life as a female, my name now is Steve. I'm not going to call myself Stevania. Right. Right. But this, I think, is documented evidence that we are both progressives. Okay. We're not. We're not upset that that she's transgender. We're upset at her fucking yeah. name choice. <laughs> that bitch. I, I, I'm just, a, I'm, I am upset. I'm pretty sure this isn't offensive to the LGBTQ community. It's just, if you're going to, if you're going to, if you're going to change your name, don't fucking... You have your choice. There's no rules. Right. It's okay. It's upsetting. Okay. I I understand. I really understand how hard it is to be a transgendered person in our society. Yes. But choosing your own name, that's one of the small perks. Okay. Yeah. You guys bad shit. Let's watch it. Oh, my new name is going to be Alice Stain. We should yeah. watch a movie. My life is a zucchini. It's not going. I'm, don't don't pick a new name based on your old name. That, that, that but, just that's weak sauce. Yeah. But I think there may be a downside to this. Okay. Yeah. There may be a downside. Uh, there might be like a lot of Cleopatras and Helens and. Oh, but it's short. Those are the only two historic women I can think of. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Which is its own statement. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, Speed Racer cost $120 million to make, and that's not including advertising, and they advertise the shit out of this. It made only $93 million in the box office, so that's a big loss. Uh-huh. Now, originally, I was going... I, I, originally, I was not going to discuss the history of Speed Racer in Japan and how it originated. I wasn't going to do that because I, I feel that that's already a popular story that a lot of people know 